here's a query, where is the best pizza in London? Okay, so here Google is looking for the intent, which is, um, you know, I'm looking for an entity, I'm looking for a place, a location, I'm looking where. I'm looking for best, that's the qualifier. I want, oh, this is what I want. Pizza is the entity, and London is obviously the geographical location. So it pulls all those things together to return what's called a blended SERP. So here you'll see some articles returned, as you might normally see, and you'll also see these physical locations. You know, these are probably through Google Places that you can set up for, for your business. So the idea here is that between these two, they think that they can satisfy my search. Okay, I've also got the map here showing the literal locations, but it's interesting if we see what's at play here in this SERP. Okay, for example, on this second post here, there's some authorship here. We see that Jason Allen has created this post. We see that he has connected with 40, 53 people in his Google circle, and it, it's relatively recent. This was posted this year, September, so it's not too long ago. So Google's thinking, okay, if I present a recent uh, a recent article from a verified trusted author and a, and a verified source, there's a likelihood that this is really quite popular. If we move down to the specific locations, it's not so much that the average ranking is the important thing, it's more that look at the number of reviews. If you think about what Google's trying to evaluate here, it's more important to it that it has 250 people who have taken the time to evaluate Pizza East and give it a good rating of four than the few people, well, the 58 that have um, evaluated Santori and it actually has a higher ranking. I've highlighted Santori here as well also because if you look, it's actually its Google Plus profile that's returned and it's not its website. So that's an interesting element too. So what does this mean for you and for SEO going forward? If you're a business owner, it's very important that you identify your USP, your unique selling proposition. What is it that differentiates you from your competition? If you don't know what that is, you need to take a serious think about it and, and, and try to craft a way that you can. You want to become authoritative in your field and convey this credibility, this trust that will emanate from the content on your website and to your user. As I've mentioned there briefly, it's about moving away from this keyword dependency and ranking for this halo phrase that you think is going to bring all this traffic and to think more about a topic and a concept as a whole. Your site should be this portal for all this information on your said subject, and you should be able to satisfy a user who comes in on any associated term and synonym within that area, and, they, and they, can be, they can get what they want. With the not provided incidents increasing dramatically, traffic data is going to be insufficient as a metric. You're still going to be able to use landing pages, bounce rate to evaluate loosely how things are working, but it's no longer that you're going to get this information. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. It means that we have to marry these two entities with some more traditional elements. So some case studies, some focus groups, reaching out through your social channels, asking your customers what works for you. What do you like about my site? What don't you like? What are you looking for that I could possibly help? Use email for this too. Engage with people that already appreciate your brand and your work and then try to satisfy this. I mean, the information is there. It's just about you reaching out to them in the right manners. Structured data markup. Um, majority of you have probably heard of this, and we saw incidents of it on this previous slide. Schema.org is a great tool, and what it basically does is it gives you the opportunity to, to mark up information on your site in your HTML and let Google know, and giving it, giving it a guide to say, this is an address, this is a phone number, this is a date, this is a review, this is a testimonial. By doing this, you're making Google's job easier to collate the information when someone's looking for information. So it, it likes this, trust me, so you should definitely spend time, especially if you're working on a physical location where you're dependent on foot traffic and you have a time of business and that kind of thing. Mark up this information on your site and, and it will help you rank in the search results. Obviously there's spoken search. I think um, we're kind of the generation we're beginning to start to do it. You know, we're talking into our phones and we're asking. The next generation, it's what they're gonna do. They're not going to be on the desktop typing in these things. It's going to be spoken. So we have to think about how we can optimize our sites to fulfill that. Social signals. I've put a little question mark here. Um, reason being is that the Hummingbird update, it's widely believed that there is built-in capability for Google to start to take into consideration social activity and signals into its ranking algorithm. Right now, it's a bit muddy as to whether they do or not. They officially say they don't. But I think they can, but this new algorithm has the ability. So it's important that we start to engage socially. We start to share content and in the right way on the right platform. So we've got to think about that. The good news for all of us 
is this isn't going to be an overnight change. You're not going to wake up tomorrow and see your traffic fall through the floor, your rankings plummet, and your customers disappear. This is still in its infancy. It's still being slowly tested and rolled out, primarily in America right now. We're not seeing a lot of it here, but it will come. The existing ranking signals that you've worked so hard to attain, they're still going to count. So, you know, good authority of links from trusted sources, um, a structurally sound website with fantastic page speed, all these different elements. Don't neglect them, they're still very important. One thing we can't ignore is that mobile search is the buzzword for 2014. It's pretty much at the forefront of what Google does, and it's not going to go away. They've pretty much said they're targeting the mobile search, and if you look at 30% of organic visits in the third quarter of this year that came through Google came from mobile. Okay, so that's a third. It's pretty good. And it won't be long, you know, a couple of years at the max till it's the majority. You know, it's up 9% from this time last period, so it's, it's here to stay. I think what's important for all of us is to analyze your visitor breakdown. Go into your analytics, see what instance you're currently seeing. How many people are coming to your site via these different platforms? You know, you may be someone that sells a, you know, a cheap item on, online and you already do a, a, a great amount of e-commerce through these um, mobile platforms. And that's fantastic. You've been doing for, so for a long time. That's great. You might sell wind turbines and you might think no one is ever, ever going to buy a wind turbine from their smartphone. Probably right. But you know what? They're going to search. They're going to be doing their searches. They're going to want this information. So you've got to be there or your competitors will be. So it's not enough to say, ah, I'm not going to sell there. People want the information. They also want a fully fledged experience. Gone are the days where they're going to accept a dressed down version of your desktop site on mobile. It's just not going to happen. So to that end, you've got to develop a mobile content strategy like-minded, you know, to go along with your desktop strategy. Now, it doesn't have to be a million miles apart, but the way that people want information on mobile is different from how they want it on desktop, okay? They're going to consume the visual elements a lot better, video, graphics, everything should be socially shareable, very easy. They don't want to go through reams and reams of content like we have on our desktop sites. They want little tidbits. You're going to have to tease the content with nice headlines and little snippets, that kind of thing to whet the appetite, but, you know, not to scare them away. So the important thing is to test, test, and test again. Look at what your competition is doing. You know, see what, they, what, see what you like, see what you don't like, see what you can improve upon, and just keep looking at it and keep working at it. But it should be at the forefront um, for next year, if not already. So you've no doubt heard that content is king. Always has been. We've said it for a long, long time. But there's a little kind of switch on that now that context is king. So this need for original, high-quality content on your site is still very important. But all this content, it needs to be self-sufficient. There's no point creating pages for pages' sake. When people are accessing your site on these longer tail searches with specific queries, they need to be able to be satisfied. It used to be that we, you know, we'd create all these different pages and, and try to drive traffic to this one halo page and boost this ranking. It's not the case now. We want to create this depth of content through long form guides, Q&As, tips, all different kinds of things to satisfy this long tail search, but it has to add value. So that might mean you have to do a lot more research or you know, your team has to do some more research into how this data can be presented. Visual assets is a term that Rand Fishkin at Moz uses and I like that a lot. It's how to present information as opposed to just text on a page. You know, obviously there's graphics, there's videos. You know, can we present information as a bar graph at times? Absolutely. Can that be then be socially shared a lot easier than information? Absolutely. So just think about how your user is going to digest this and improve this experience. It's important to become an informational resource. What I mean by that is you could be an e-commerce site that sells hats, for example. The example here is a fedora and a Stetson. You may not know, not know what that is, but basically different kinds of hats. People who want to buy one of those hats, they may want to do some research as to how they're made, the history behind it, famous people that have worn it, when's it appropriate to wear one or the other. So these are informational sources they're doing prior to the buying decision. If you're this, if you're this credible you know, seller of hats online, it's important that you have this information on your site. You're this informational resource, so you can capture this search, this informational traffic, and then you can filter them to these converting pages on site. That's going to enhance your credibility in Google. It's going to improve the customer flow and the conversion rate. And then, you know, if you're trying to say, "Hey, Google, I am this authority in hats," they're going to be like, "You know what? Look at you have all this information. It's pertinent. It's good. You are. It's going to help you." Recency is important too. It doesn't mean that you have to you know, upload brand new pages to your site on a daily basis. 
but you should set time in your marketing plan and your schedule to review your on-site content. You know, there's no point putting a site up and leaving it for five years and expecting it to work. You know, to, maybe just a section of your site every couple of months. Go in there, just read the content. Has something new come out in your industry that you could change or, or discuss? Has some new terminology developed? You know, just, just have a way that we can freshen this and Google takes freshness into consideration in its ranking algorithm. Make sure your content's attributed. That means setting up your Google Plus profile, linking it to your content on site. If you're creating this great original content, you should get credit for it. You know, you as a user want to establish this content. As we saw with Jason Allen in the search results, that authorship, you know, it doesn't necessarily impact your ranking directly all the time, but it does increase click-through rate. It's proven to do so. So it's important if you're spending time to create this content that you get the credit you deserve. Last thing here is make sure you're giving the right message at the right time for the right audience. That means the conversations that you have on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, that's, they're all different. The, the customer base is different. The way they talk and the information they expect is different. That means you have to tailor content specifically to that channel. Now, it doesn't mean you have to create five different pieces of content for the same thing, but you do have to repurpose your content slightly to make sure that it fits that and it's going to increase engagement. Okay, so a little bit of homework, a little bit of takeaways for everybody. So go back and look at your sites and do you answer these specific queries? The p people that are looking for your services and your brand, what are they looking for? Think about it, get, step away from the business owner for a moment and think about it as someone who's looking for your products and services. What kind of information can you give to satisfy and support their search and their buying decision? A good way to test this is by varying your blog post format. That's usually a safe way, you know, once a month maybe do a Q&A or a, an interview with someone on your staff who's you know, got a lot of information and credibility they can share in a different manner, that can help. If you've not already done so, create your Google Plus profile and set up real authorship for all your content. It's the first thing you should do, it's not too difficult and it can have you know, a good impact and you can start to build some authority. The important thing is also participate in the social sphere. It's not enough to set up all, you know, Pinterest, LinkedIn, all the different social platforms and then link them to your homepage and say, okay, there you go, watch it work. It's not enough. You've got to take time. It's a dedicated practice. Yes, it can be tedious at times and it will take a little while, but it will be worth it in the end. I stopped short of saying embrace the new Google properties, but it is important to understand them. These shifts for Google Glass, Google Now, and whatever else is down the road, Google's doing this for a reason, and they want to create information and provide it in a manner that's going to be digestible in these new platforms. So it's important that you look at that and you understand how you can then process and tag up your information on your site to support that. It's going to increase the likelihood that you can be returned in the search results. If you've not already done so, I'm sure you have by now, prioritize your mobile site development. It's very important. This can be responsive web design. It can be a standalone mobile site. Um, the responsive design is a little bit easier to implement. It still refers to the same URL. It's just a different CSS style sheet. Whereas the standalone mobile site, you need some canonicalization, some you know, 301 redirects, and it can be a little bit trickier, and it can hurt your rankings if it's not implemented correctly. But it, it won't, neither will affect which one ranks better. Continue your high quality link earning activity. You know, if, you've, if you're spending time to engage with trusted sources in your marketplace and provide good content and getting some links back, that's still okay, done in the right manner. More importantly, think about creating content on your site that's going to naturally attract links. You know, I talk to my clients and we talk about, you know, on a three-month or quarterly or six-month basis, let's think about creating what I call big content, something special, something that's going to be naturally shareable. You know, it can be a little bit off topic as long as you can you know take the credit and, and boost the brand recognition you know it does take a little bit more cost and it does take a little bit more time but it can have a good benefit another thing to do is develop your brand I mean everybody here has a brand to some extent Google loves big brands we all know it but you are a brand in your marketplace and in your sector you might be a local flower shop around the corner catering to people in this area you still have a brand you know, you can engage off-site, sponsor the local football team, get involved in some charity activities, you know, donate flowers to something. Get your brand out there. Get that word of mouth spreading. It's a great assistance for your business. And the final thing I'll leave you with is I think the most important thing is to diversify your traffic sources. If you're relying on organic travel from Google as your sole business provider, you're always going to be susceptible to the next big update. Google Organic should be important, and it's a, it is a vital element, but it shouldn't be the be-all and end-all. 
Think about some paid advertising a little bit. Test that. See if it works for you. You know, continue with email campaigns. Work off-site. You know, you know, reaching out to these case studies and getting your know, local news, some PR from trusted sites when you've got something newsworthy. It's all a big part of the market and mix, and no one thing should be the, the be-all and end-all. Okay, so thanks for your time, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, any questions, we're at the booth just there with a big neon sign to the left-hand side. Love to answer any questions and chat a little bit. If you connect socially, um, I'll share the uh, presentation and anything else you want to know. Thanks a lot. Thanks. We, we, do, we do have five minutes, so if there are any questions, please, please shout. There you go. Yeah? Hummingbird update into one sentence. Sorry, can I hear you? You're going to put hummingbird update into one sentence. What's that one sentence that says oh. what hummingbird is? One sentence. I'd say it's satisfying long tail search. That's what it's about. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. You don't have to shout. Yeah, I think so. I think. I think it's about you know delving into your customer base to try and find you know what people are searching for, what they're looking for, what information you know, and how they're searching. You know, is it question and answer? Is it you know get stepping away from the business and thinking about the, the supporting information they need to make that buying decision? So reaching out to your existing client base and fly out asking, trying to get some feedback into that, and then thinking about the long tail. You know, these so it's how to, how can I, when making this, how would I? Those kind of informational searches. So. Try and do it naturally, and, no, and it's not about creating a new page of content for every single you know, variation of this. It's about just writing with your authority, thinking about a concept and not a keyword, and I think you'll, you'll, you'll probably be best served. Yeah? Yep. Oh, it's my affiliate marketer. How important is uh, authorship, Google Plus authorship to include on the post? Yeah, um, Google Plus authorship is very important, I'd say. If, if you're creating this, it, it has been seen to increase click-through. So if you're ranking in the SERPs and there's someone that has their little picture and their little author and their name by it, that gets more clicks. It's a fact. Now, is it going to make you rank number one as opposed to number two? There's no direct relevance to that, or Google's not saying so, but it does take it into consideration. And my basic general just is Google Plus is an entity that Google has prioritized, and a lot of their senior managers, you know, they gave up their bonuses at the time to, to fund this. Uh, venture, so it's in their best interest that they want it to work, and they're going to make it work because they make the rules. So, I think if it's telling you and giving you an opportunity to do this, it's important that we do. And again, it's a relatively easy thing to do, uh, particularly if you're trying to l link it to a WordPress blog. It's it's a half an hour at max, and, um, and it can add you know good benefit. And not just that, it can boost your credibility in the, in the search and in your search space as an authority. Someone's going to recognise you, and suddenly you're going to show up you know more often. Oh, follow-up question. Follow-up question. Okay, so Google authorship is a personal profile on Google Plus. Yeah. So everybody is supposed to have only one profile. Yeah. Personal profile. But what happens if, for example, the same person is writing about a variety of topics? Should this person use uh, the same Google Plus profile for all the projects, which can be completely uh, uh, different? Or should create artificial, artificial no, no, you should just have the one profile. You can be a contributor on several different blogs or sites. Yeah, sorry. The question was if an author is contributing on several different websites or blogs, should they create several different you know, authorship profiles on Google Plus? And the answer is no. You can create, you can contribute through your contribute to section on Google Plus to a whole host, I think, I think it's unlimited to be honest, I'm not sure exactly, to a whole host of blogs. The confusion would be if you know if you're talking about you know birds over here and then you're talking about car engines over here, are, you know could you really be an expert on both? Um, I don't I don't know. It depends on the, it depends on the quality and the volume of content that you are contributing on each subject. But no, it should be it's you as a person and you're writing about whatever you're writing about. You should get the credit and one one profile is enough. Got one more. So um, about mobile design. Yeah. Uh, now you can ask me a techie question. Oh, no. No, I am. Um, if you use WordPress, what kind of WordPress template should you look for that would work both for mobile and for desktop? I mean, is it responsive design? or? To be honest, you probably know more about the actual technical elements of it than me. Um, luckily, I've got a great team that I defer to on those questions. But um, 
the, the specific design, I could, I could, if you come in that, give me your information, I can find out for you. But uh, yeah, my, my technical knowledge stops at the need. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that satisfact, uh, satisfying queries is, well, very important. Yep. So how does uh, Google measure that? Is it like engagement in terms of traffic? Or yeah, it'll be a lot of engagement. It'll be bounce rate. It'll be the number of pages. You know, someone who comes to your site, do they then, do they then delve deeper into, into the site and seek more information? How long are they spending on site? It, you know, if, if they're literally clicking on your site, seeing they're not satisfied and bouncing, you know, that's going to impact. They take that. It's all part of how they then later return a different set of results if, if what they've given the first time doesn't satisfy, you know? Thanks. Okay, thanks Are very much. All right, thank you very much.